I have a I have a presentation here that I will give for 20 minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, another aspect of the environment, which is trying to address global warming, uh, air pollution, and energy security uh, through transitioning to entirely clean renewable energy. And I'm going to talk about cal plans for California and the US and actually a study that we just published yesterday on 145 countries to transition. So the problems that we are trying to solve are threefold. Um, air pollution causes 7 million air pollution premature deaths per year worldwide, including about 12,000 in California and about 80,000 in the US, uh, costing the world about $30 trillion per year based on statistical cost of life. Global warming is estimated to cost the world about $30 trillion per year by 2050 and is already causing substantial damage, as we can see uh, almost weekly. And energy security is a third problem. Not only are fossil fuels becoming scarce, and when they run out, that will result in substantial price increases in economic, social, and political instability. But we can see price increases today due to uh, energy blackmail by some countries over other countries, the, the control of energy uh, by some countries over other countries, the need to import fuels, then that's very expensive to do. Uh, the fact that we have lots of centralized power plants and, as, and that makes uh, our energy supply vulnerable because if one power plant goes out, that takes down a large portion of the grid. And there are other types of energy security issues. These are all dr drastic problems that require drastic and immediate solutions. So our solution has been to electrify all energy and provide the electricity with clean renewable sources. So for example, transportation, we go to battery electric vehicles and some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for long distance heavy transport. For building heating and cooling, we'd go to, go to electric heat pumps, uh, primarily for air heating, water heating, and air conditioning. Uh, we'd use what's called district heating, which is where you have centralized heaters and coolers for, it could be a campus, it could be a city, uh, it could be a hospital. Um, and so then you, you have a centralized heater, then you pipe hot water or cold water to buildings to heat or cool the buildings. And that's actually very efficient. Uh, then there'll be some geothermal direct heat from hot under the ground, uh, hot water and hot soil uh, and some solar direct heat. And for industry, we would use, we electrify that as well with existing technologies, uh, namely electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters. These are all existing technologies. We power the electricity for all these sectors by just onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power or CSP, geothermal electricity, hydroelectricity, and small amounts of tidal and wave power. Well, we would also need um, storage for the system because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. So the main types of storage, well, there's electricity storage, hot storage, cold storage, and then some hydrogen storage. Electricity storage, well, batteries obviously are, are very convenient, uh, but there's also concentrated solar power with storage, pumped hydroelectric power, uh, existing hydroelectric dams, flywheels, compressed air storage, gravitational storage, I don't have time to go into all these, but these are just a list of existing types of electricity storage technologies. The main types of storage for hot and cold today are water tanks. You can store heat and cold in water. Uh, you can store cold in ice. Um, for example, Stanford University had a big ice cube under a building for many years. Uh, so when the electricity price was low during the night, it was used to produce ice. And dur then during the day, when it was hot outside, instead of using air conditioning, water was sent through coils in the ice and the water, cold water was sent to buildings to cool buildings. Well, other types of storage, there's underground storage in boreholes. So you can actually store uh, heat and soil in water pits, the big, basically big swimming pools of water and aquifers, which are underground water storage where you can store hot and cold. And then building materials is another uh, place where you can store heat usually. And hydrogen, as I mentioned, is a form of storage. Well, um, let's just, just one example of a storage. So Stanford University uh, in 2016, it replaced a natural gas cogeneration plant, which provided 80% of the campus electricity and heat uh, with this fourth generation district heating system and cooling system. 
And so what this does is they laid about 30 miles of cold water pipes and 30 miles of hot water pipes. And here you see two chillers. There's two big water tanks that are black. Those are chillers. And then one boiler, which is the red one. And when you need cool, cold air or water, you send cold water to the buildings. And when you need hot air or water, you send the hot water to the buildings. And electric heat pumps are used to raise the temperature of the heat in the hot water tank and to lower the temperature uh, of the cold in the cold water tanks. And the electric heat run, pumps run on electricity. The campus then purchased about 150 megawatts of electricity, including about five to 10 megawatts on buildings and 140 or so in two power plants in the Central Valley. And so the university became the first university in the world to be 100% renewable, not only electricity, but also for heating and cooling. Uh, unfortunately, last week, the power for the campus went out because PG&E still controls the transmission to the university. And when that went out, well, the solar from the valley couldn't get there. So all we had was the uh, solar on the roofs, which is not nearly enough. And so the power went out. So this is an argument for creating what are called microgrids, where the university and other regions and hospitals, for example, are self-contained and they can still generate their own power even when the transmission lines go out. And, but you, to do that, you need enough electricity production, usually by solar in this case, plus batteries. Now to that end, I wanna talk about transitioning individual home to 100% renewables. And I'm going to talk about my own home, which I built, uh, moved in in 2017. And it has no gas on the property. It's all electric. It has solar photovoltaics on the rooftop. So it has, has power, uh, it has batteries in the garage. And there's about 13.6 kilowatts of solar. The batteries uh, kick in in the morning when solar starts getting produced. Electricity first goes to fill the batteries. It, well, it first is used for household use, but then the, the excess goes to fill the batteries. If anything is remaining after filling the batteries, that gets sent to the grid and sold to the grid. Then at night, when the sun goes down, the first thing that happens is that the batteries start to discharge. And for 75% of the year, the batteries provide electricity 24 hours a day. Um, only during winter months do I then sometimes need grid electricity during the night um, because the days are too short and the power demand is, is sufficient. So for electric for heating, I use what are called ductless mini split heat pump air heaters, and also use the same for air conditioning because heat pumps run in reverse as air conditioners. And with a ductless uh, system, there are, there are no ducts, so, so usually you have like a centralized heater in a house, and then you have ducts that send the heat around to different rooms. Here in each room, you have one of these units on the left, and on the right is the outside unit. So for, for let's say there, for each of these outside units, there are about six or seven of the inside units attached to them. And they're only connected by uh, tubes of coolant. And basically without going into details, heat pumps, they just move heat from the outside to the inside when you need heating, or they extract cold out of the air from the outside and move it to the inside when you need cooling. And so they're moving heat and cold instead of creating it. And as a result, they use only one fourth the energy as a natural gas heater. They're so efficient, they use hardly any energy. And you can extract the heat not only from the air, even at high temperatures, or low, sorry, even at low temperatures outside, you can extract heat from the air, but you can also extract it from the soil or you can extract it from the water. So if you extract it from the soil, it's called the ground source heat pump. If you extract it from the water, uh, it's a water source heat pump. Uh, for water heating, I use a heat pump water heater, which again, it ex in this case, it extracts heat from the room that the uh, device sits in. And it then heat uses that heat and compresses it and, and heats the water. And it works perfectly well. It does not use any gas. And it uses one fourth the energy as a natural gas heater. For a stove, I use what's called an electric induction cooktop, not a, an electric resistance stove, but electric induction which boils water in half the time as natural gas. And when you touch the stove, it doesn't even feel hot. Uh, and it it's, uh, cooks evenly and many chefs really like it, although I'm not a good chef myself. But anyway, five years of energy use, I've generated 
120% of all my home and vehicle energy use. I forgot to mention I have two electric vehicles. I paid no electric bill, no natural gas bill, no gasoline bill. And I've received an average of $860 per year from the my community choice aggregation utility uh, who basically took over from PG&E for the generation portion of my bill. PG&E still does the transmission distribution portion of the bill. But um, they pay for the extra electricity you generate at the same price that I would have paid for electricity uh, if I had actually used it at that time. So average over five years, I produced 20% more than I consumed. On top of that, I avoided a gas hookup fee. PG&E was going to charge $6,000 just to hook up gas from the corner of my property to the property itself. I avoided about $10,000 in gas pipes. These numbers are ranges for typical homes. And as I mentioned, I avoided electric bill, gas bill, and gasoline bill. So there's an upfront cost savings plus uh, as a yearly savings, basically. And there are subsidies on top of that. With subsidies, it's about a five-year payback. Without subsidies, it's 10 years. But the solar is warranted for 25 years. So no matter what, it's definitely worthwhile. Next question is, well, can we go on the large scale and transition the entire world for all purposes? Uh, with entirely clean renewable energy. And the same question about the US and California. So as I mentioned, we just finished and published roadmaps for 145 countries. And if we sum over all countries, the, and these represent 99.7% of all world emissions, in 2018, the end use power requirements of all these countries was 13.1 terawatts or trillion watts. If we go forward to 2050, those are that is expected to go up to 20.4 trillion watts. But if we electrify and provide the electricity with wind and water and solar only, we go down 56% to 8.9 terawatts. So how is that possible? How do we reduce the power requirements just by transitioning our energy? Well, I mentioned heat pumps. Heat pumps, each heat pump is about reduces energy required by 75%, but average over all sectors, that's about 13.6%. Battery electric vehicles, similarly, each battery electric vehicle compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle uses one fifth the energy. But averaged over all energy sectors, there's a 20.5% savings by going to battery electric vehicles. So by the way, with the current cost of gasoline as let's say six or $7 a gallon, the equivalent cost of driving an electric vehicle is about 80 cents a gallon. So if you drive 15,000 miles per year, which is average for the US, for 15 years, that's on the order of a 40 to $45,000 savings over the life of a car in fuel. So it's really uh, no wonder why we are all going to go to electric vehicles eventually. It's just there's gasoline vehicles are just so inefficient in terms of fuel cost. Here's a timeline for transitioning to 100% renewables across all across the world. Well. By 2050, if we don't do anything, we go along that top line again up to 20.4 terawatts. Then if we transition to 100% renewables, we go down those five shades of colors to the 100% WWS line, that's 8.9 terawatts. And for the five reasons I mentioned, well, that were listed on the previous page. And I didn't, I forgot to mention, well, the other reasons besides battery electric vehicles and heat pumps is that you know, if we electrify industry, there's an efficiency there. Also, about 11.3% of all energy worldwide is used just to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. And so we no longer need to do that with a wind, water, solar system because wind comes right to the turbine, solar comes right to the panel. Uh, and then there's energy efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. And then when at the 100% WWS line, then we're gonna have a mix of onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics, and concentrated solar power, et cetera. And this shows the mix. Now we envision an 80% transition by 2030. In other words, well, that's what we need is an 80% transition by 2030 and 100% by no later than 2050, but ideally by 2035. So that's really the timeline. Well, how much land would this take up? Now, worldwide, it would take up about around half a percent of the world's land. And with most of that being onshore wind and utility PV plus CSP is most of the rest. We do not need new land for offshore wind, for tidal or wave power. We have no new hydroelectric power in these plans. Uh, rooftop photovoltaics do not take up any new land and there's hardly any geothermal. So it's all, mostly onshore 
wind, utility PV, and CSP. For the US, it's about 0.84% of the land. For California, well, WECC is the Western region of the US that where there's an inter interconnected grid, and it's about 0.3%, and that's about what it would be for, for California as well. And this just shows that we can keep the grid stable in the Western US if we transition to entirely renewable uh, wind, water, and solar, which is going to be primarily wind and solar, 90, over 90% 90 wind and solar. This just shows we can keep the grid stable exactly for several years without any blackouts. And that's good news. But what's the cost? Well, worldwide, the capital cost of transitioning is $62 trillion. In the US, it's about $9 trillion. In the Western US, it's about $1 trillion to transition. Uh, however, uh, what is the cost savings each year? And this, then we can see, we'll see that even though we have an upfront cost, that the payback time is going to be about between five and six years. This shows that worldwide energy costs per year uh, for the world in a business as usual case, which is with conventional fuels like what we have now, but in 2050, will be over $17 trillion per year. Health costs, though, are another $33 trillion per year. Climate costs, $32 trillion. Total of $83 trillion per year is the social cost. However, when we transition to wind, water, solar, we eliminate health and climate costs. Our energy costs go down 63% to $6.6 .6 trillion per year, not only because we have 56% lower uh, energy requirements, like I mentioned, but there's another about 12, 13% reduction in the cost per unit energy. So it's a 92% reduction in the social cost, 63% reduction in the energy cost. The difference, even though there's a $63 trillion per uh, total, $63 trillion upfront capital cost, you can see the energy cost savings alone here is on the order of $10, $11 trillion per year. So we're talking about a six year payback time. And that's the same, we can go to California and the US and we find the same thing. It's a six year payback time to transition everything. Last comments I want to make are about policies. Uh, in 2009, we developed our first energy plan, and it was a worldwide plan that was on the cover of Scientific American. And it was questions whether we could transition the entire world to wind, water, and solar by 2030. Uh, and the conclusion was, well, while it's technically and economic, economically possible to transition, for, there are social and political barriers that may make a transition uh, unlikely by then. And 2050 would be a more likely target or better target to, you know, from a, or pra more practical target. Turns out that this paper was the scientific basis for the Green New Deal, which is a policy proposal that started in the US to transition the whole uh, country to 100% renewables. Well, since then, there are also now 61 countries that have committed to 100% renewable electricity, which is not all energy. Electricity represents about 20% of all end use energy. Uh, most of these are small countries, but you know, there's Spain and Denmark or uh, bigger countries. Uh, Denmark is actually only one of these countries that has committed to 100% in all energy sectors. There are 13 countries that are near or above 100% renewables in their electric power sector today already. And these are listed here. Almost all of them have hydroelectric power as their main source of electricity. But Scotland is mostly wind and uh, Kenya is mostly geothermal. But um, there are now 18 states and territories in the US that have 100% renewable electricity laws or policies. Uh, Rhode Island, just today or yesterday, uh, the governor signed a law that it'll go 100% renewable electricity by 2033. Washington, DC is 2032. And you can see the rest here. California is by 2045, um, which is good news. There are 180 US cities that have committed to 100% renewable electricity as well, including many in California. Um, and some of them are listed here as well, including San Francisco and San Jose. Uh, and then finally, there are th over 360 international companies, including eight of the 10 biggest companies in the world that have committed to 100% renewable. So th these companies are driving a lot of the transition going on. So just to summarize, uh, we found also that we would worldwide, we'd create about 28 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost. Uh, in the US, it's about three to 4 million. We'd require only about 0.53% of the world's land for, uh, for such a new infrastructure. We'd avoid 7 million air pollution deaths per year. We could slow than reverse global warming and provide energy 
security. We can keep the grid stable uh, and we have much lower energy costs, annual energy costs and much lower energy plus health plus climate costs uh, with such a transition. Uh, and finally, if you want more information, here are some links. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions later, but I think I have to stop there. Thank you, Mark. This is really enlightening. You make a good case on why we need to, to back um, this and support it. So tell us from individuals, what can we do to help push this initiative forward? Well, individuals can do a lot in their own lives, including, I mean, uh, well, those who are have homes, certainly energy efficiency measures, uh, like weatherizing a home, changing to LED lights, uh, using energy efficient appliances, the next vehicle, electric vehicles, uh, and removing gas from buildings. So getting rid of gas furnaces for heating, gas stoves. And actually there are several communities in the Bay Area that have uh, now rules or laws to either prevent new uh, buildings from having natural gas in them, or even in the case of Menlo Park, trying to re 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 force retrofits to get rid of gas in existing buildings. Um, so that's what individuals can do, and also telecommuting more, driving driving less, walking more, you know, the standard things, but also then supporting policies that are supportive of transitioning to renewable energies. So there's things that people can do in their own lives, plus supporting policies. And there are as I mentioned, utilities that will support 100% renewable. So even if, let's say, people who are renting apartments, uh, they, you know, they can't necessarily put solar on their own roof, but they can actually contract with a utility that under a 100% renewables electricity agreement that all their electricity will be renewable and at the same cost as conventional fuels. Oh, that's good to know. So we do have a, a question. So if anybody from the audience has a question, you can go ahead and type it in the Q and A box. And this first question is, can you explain cogeneration? What is the advantage in the future of this? Well, co the standard cogeneration is like with natural gas where um, you burn the gas and it, to run a turbine to provide electricity, but then there's waste heat and then you'll capture some of the heat for heating. So if with fossil fuels, there's hopefully no future in that because we want to get rid of the fossil fuels. But um, there's some kind of, like cogeneration of electricity and heat, like for with hydrogen, where you know in a microgrid, if you have stored hydrogen, you can use the hydrogen in a fuel cell to generate electricity. But there's also waste heat, and that can be captured and used um, simultaneously. So the nice thing about using hydrogen in a fuel cell is there there's no emission. Of, there's no it's not you're not burning the hydrogen, so there's no combustion emissions. There's just um, the the hydrogen gets converted into water. And that's the only emission out of it, but you generate electricity and heat. And tell us a little bit about more about hydrogen, because hydrogen is something that's been around for a long time, but we're just starting to hear more and more like people converting to it. So tell us um, what you yeah. can about hydrogen. Well, so hydrogen, we want to limit its use to certain useful applications, and but not for everything that's being claimed because it's also being used as a cover by the fossil fuel industry to keep going because 96% of all hydrogen produced today is by is from natural gas, natural gas to hydrogen. And we, what we wanna do is produce all the hydrogen in the future by what's called electrolysis, where you pass electricity through water. And that, that's a really clean way of doing it. And it's actually very simple and it's not that expensive either. Um, so we wanna limit how we produce hydrogen to electrolysis, and that's called green hydrogen. When you produce hydrogen from natural gas, that's called gray hydrogen. If you produce hydrogen from natural gas and then you try to capture the carbon, that's called blue hydrogen, and that's almost as bad as gray hydrogen. So we only want green hydrogen. Then the next question is, what do we use the hydrogen for? Well, the, the only useful applications really are long distance heavy transport, like long distance aircraft, long distance ships, long distance trucks and trains, not for passenger vehicles. Battery electric are much more efficient, three times the efficiency of hydrogen for a passenger vehicle. Uh, we do not want to use hydrogen for home heating, um, but we do want to use it for steel production to eliminate carbon in steel production. We do want to use it um, for remote microgrids, like I mentioned, 
far away where you have a remote microgrid where you don't have other sources of electricity or heat, you can use the hydrogen in a fuel cell to produce electricity and heat, and you can store it in a lot of it for a, at a given time. So we don't want to use it also for stationary grid storage. We don't want to use it for home heating, as I mentioned, and we don't want to use it for passenger vehicles. So, um, Mark, you are a professor at Stanford, and you are the director of atmosphere energy programs. You've talked to legislators. You've even been on um, David Letterman. Tell us, the, tell us what your what your goal is. Well, my whole career is based on trying to understand and solve large scale air pollution and climate problems uh, through clean renewable energy. So I knew what I wanted to do when I was like 13 years old and back in the 1970s. And I've tried to focus on that my entire career after and my studies after that. Uh, so that's still my goal is to try to solve the climate problem, air, world air pollution problems that cause 7 million deaths and hundreds of millions of illnesses worldwide and to provide energy security for nations around the world. Um, yeah, so that's my research and the motivation for my work. Well, thank you for all the work you're doing. We're very happy that you could join us today and give us a, a little bit of insight into what you know. I know that um, it's just infinite, the information that we could gather here. And the, for the legacy talks and for our initiative, we're focused on educating people. And you know, if people live in apartments, you know, what can they do? If people live in homes, what they can, what can they do? If people live in senior living, what can they do? And a lot of it comes down to being a steward of the environment. How can we share this information with other people so that they're knowledgeable and they have the facts? So thank you, Mark, for sharing all your information with us today. Yeah, thank you very much for asking me to be on here. So next we have Simone Berkovitz, and Simone is a project manager and zero waste educator with Marin Sanitary Services. Welcome, Simone. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, um, so my name's Simone. I work with Marin Sanitary Service and we're the waste hauler for central Marin County. And today I'm gonna talk about waste reduction to curb climate change. And so I'm gonna go over some recycling and compost tips, why it's important to compost and recycle and a little bit about my background. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Ojai, California, which is a small town in Southern California, and I was very fortunate to grow up spending a lot of time um, outdoors, in nature. So from an early age, I became really passionate about the environment and conserving natural resources and protecting our planet. So I went on to pursue this passion at Claremont McKenna College, where I studied um, environment, economics, and politics. So really focusing on the intersection of environmental policy and business. Um, since then, I've worked as an environmental consultant um, with local governments, also with open space conservation planning, and now I currently work in zero waste outreach and education with Marin Sanitary Service. And just personally, I love spending time in nature, surfing, climbing, backpacking, hiking. This is actually a photo um, from a place in California, if you can believe it, there's actually glaciers in the Sierras that still exist today and look like that, so that was a really cool experience. Um, and I just love working to protect our planet and curb, curb climate change. So Marin Sanitary Service is the resource hauler from, for Central Marin. We were started in 1948 and actually in 1979, we started the first curbside re recycling program in the US. So pretty cool that Marin was leading the way with recycling. Um, we have three separate divisions. We service about 30,000 residential customers and 3,000 commercial accounts in Central Marin. And each waste hauler has slightly different rules. So if you live outside of Marin, some of the things I say today might be a little bit different for you. So I'm part of the outreach team. We're a fun team that does outreach, education, um, compliance with waste laws. And our main goal is to in increase um, diversion and reduce the amount of material that we send to the landfill. So we do a lot of education so that 
includes trainings, site visits to monitor compost and recycling programs, waste assessments, um, and more. We create educational materials like these. We work with student groups such as high school groups. I really love working with kids and helping inspire them to be the next generation change makers for our planet. Um, we also do tours of our facility with all ages. Okay, so why should we recycle and compost? Um, as we know, there's no away. When we throw things away, it has a big impact on the environment. Um, and materials not only have an impact when we throw them away, but obviously they have an impact on when, when they're produced and manufactured as well. Um, there's also many economic benefits to recycling and composting. Um, it's very expensive to just dispose of waste in the landfill. Um, and so there's many economic benefits to actually recycle and compost. And there's also several state laws. Um, ones in the past were the mandatory commercial recycling law and an older commercial organics recycling law. But now we have SB 1383, which maybe you've heard about, but it's the new law in California that actually requires everyone to have compost service. So this includes businesses, residents, um, everyone has to have a green cart and compost. And the reason for this is that um, when food waste goes to the landfill, it releases methane, which contributes to climate change. So it's actually a really big climate measure that the state has put in place to have this compost law. And it's the first waste law that actually has fines associated with it. So it's really exciting. So why is it important to recycle? So we know that paper comes from trees and when we recycle paper, it can be recycled about five to six times. Um, glass is made from sand and it takes much less energy to make glass from other glass rather than sand. And we say that glass is infinitely recyclable and it can be recycled over and over again. Um, same with aluminum. It takes much less energy to make aluminum from other aluminum rather than extracting um, the resources from the ground. It's an intensive mining process. So, and aluminum is also infinitely recyclable. And so if you have the option to choose a material that comes in aluminum, glass, or plastic, aluminum is your best choice because it's infinitely recyclable and it's also lighter than glass. Um, and plastic is actually made from oil. So plastic produces along its cycle. So we have to drill oil from the ground, which is harmful to the planet. And then plastic production facilities have harmful emissions to air quality and can affect communities surrounding it. And then as we know, once plastic is created, it often ends up in the environment and never completely breaks down and causes lots of pollution. And also plastic is really hard to recycle. Um, plastic is always what we call downcycled. So it becomes something of lower grade quality. So most plastics actually can't be recycled. The plastics that can be recycled generally become something that can't be recycled again. So for example, a plastic water bottle might become some polyester in our clothes, but once clothes are made, then they can't be recycled. So, so at Marine Sanitary Service, we keep our paper separate from the bottles and cans. And we do this that in order to keep paper clean and dry, it's better to be recycled. So if paper gets soiled by food or gets really wet, it can't actually be recycled. So that's why we have what's called a dual stream recycling system. So this might not apply to everyone if you don't live in Marin County. Um, but then the paper's compressed into bales and it's actually sold to paper recycling plants in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Taiwan. And some important things to note that um, milk cartons are not recyclable because they have a plastic lining. Um, some other places such as San Francisco might be able to recycle them, but it's very difficult and we're not able to in Marin. Same with coffee cups. Um, so for our bottles and cans recycling, of course, glass and aluminum are great materials to recycle. Um, plastic is where it gets a little tricky. Um, like I mentioned, plastic is difficult to recycle. And so in Marin County, we only are able to recycle plastic bottles, tubs, and jugs. And that's because there needs to be a market for recycling. But because of how plastic works and it gets degraded into lower quality and it's difficult to recycle, people often don't want to buy it. So when those markets don't exist, that's why we, as the um, waste hauler, are so strict about what we can actually accept in the recycling. 
So as I mentioned, plastic pollution is a huge issue. Just some statistics about this. Every year, about 8 million tons of plastic waste escape into the oceans. Um, that's equivalent of setting five garbage bags full of trash on every foot of coastline around the world. Um, so it's a big problem. You can see in this photo all that plastic waste on the beach in Cambodia. Um, and they say if current trends can continue, the amount of plastic waste polluting the oceans will grow to 29 million tons a year by 2040, the equivalent of 50 kilograms for every meter of coastline in the world. Um, maybe you've heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's an area in the ocean that's just filled with garbage and plastic, and it's about 1. million square kilometers bigger than the size of Texas. So obviously plastic is a huge issue and recycling is not gonna get us out of this crisis. So I urge all of you to try to decrease your plastic usage as much as possible. Um, as I mentioned, Plastic recycling is not closed loop, so it always degrades in quality. And that's why we say plastic is always down cycled. And then when it ends up in the environment, it never actually breaks down. It just turns into smaller pieces of microplastic. Um, they now say there's more microplastic in the sea than fish. And recently a study found that there was microplastic in human blood, which is pretty disturbing. And actually only 6% of all plastic actually gets recycled in the US. And so there's some legislation in California trying to combat these issues, um, SB 343. Maybe you've seen the recycling symbol on plastic items. And often this symbol is on items that can't actually be recycled. So this new law is gonna only allow that symbol to be on plastic items that are truly recyclable. Um, so hopefully that will help with some confusion in the future and will help plastic companies prohibit them from actually greenwashing and saying their products are recyclable. So we did a study in 2014 that kind of reflects the overall trends that actually 30% of what was sent to the landfill was actually food waste. And then another 20% was actually recyclable or recoverable materials. So only 46% is actually true garbage. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, when food waste goes to the landfill, it breaks down without oxygen because landfills are covered with dirt. And this process of food waste breaking down releases methane, which is an extremely harmful greenhouse gas said to be 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So sending food waste to the landfill directly contributes to climate change. Um, landfills are some of the nation's biggest emitters of methane. And so that's why we have the new law in California requiring everyone to compost to try to cut down on these emissions. Um, I'm sure you all know about the greenhouse gas Simone, effect. Yeah. Simone, we have a poll for the audience right now. Oh, so okay. before we go, let's get, let's ask the audience. So you should see this poll in front of you. Do you see the poll, Simone? Yes, I see it. Okay, so do you compost? So we'd like to know from the audience, do you compost? And Simone, how long have you composted? I have composted almost all my life, but I know that it's new to a lot of people. Um, fortunately, for the past eight years, I've lived in San Francisco and always had green cart compost service. And then before that, my university had composting. Um, but I know there's many people that just don't know about it or don't have the services yet. So. Yeah. And at our Sequoia Living Communities, we do have compost um, collection. And so it's something that we're continuously educating about because it's not easy. So let's hear, let's see what our audience says here. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So the answers here, do you see the sharing? Yeah. All That's right. so great to hear. 80% of people are composting their food scraps, food soiled paper, and yard waste. Amazing. Oh, thank you, everyone, <laughs> for taking this. That's awesome. And nice. then I, I saw a few people only compost yard waste. And so maybe, you know, that's only what you could compost before. So now we want to get the word out that if you have a green cart, 
you can put food waste and yard waste in it mixed together. Um, and it's really important to do that. So thank you everyone for already doing that. And then I saw some people are looking to start composting. So that's great to hear too. Um, but yeah, just get to get back to the greenhouse gas effect. I'm sure everyone's familiar with this, but this is the process um, of our planet warming and methane, which is released from food waste in the landfill, um, creates that layer of our atmosphere that traps in the heat and contributes to our planet warming, which you know we're all seeing the effects of it now. The drought we're in, the hotter days, more fires, more tornadoes, it's all happening. So everything that we can do to slow the impacts of climate change, we need to do it. Oops. Okay. Um, so at Marin Sanitary Service, we have three different organic diversion programs. So our residential and commercial compost program, that's probably what you all are familiar with. And then we also have a food to energy program. And then we do have some animals at our facility that eat leftover food waste from restaurants and grocery stores. So our food to energy program, restaurants and grocery stores divert only food scraps. And then all these food scraps are sent to Central Marin Sanitation Agency. Maybe you've seen these digesters in the picture here from the Richmond Bridge. These digesters actually capture the methane and then they're able to put it back into the grid as renewable energy. So that's pretty cool that the food waste becomes renewable energy and it's equivalent to re removing about 14,000 cars from the road currently with all the food waste we're collecting in the program. And so in the compost program that you're probably familiar with, you can put in food scraps, food soiled paper. So if you use paper plates, coffee filters, napkins, pizza boxes, cause they have that greasy food on them and then any yard waste. And so all these other materials, unfortunately have to go in the landfill. So those plastics I was mentioning that we can't recycle. So plastic utensils, plastic cups, takeout containers, chip bags, plastic bags, all those things cannot be recycled um, and have to go to the landfill. In Central Marin, we take our garbage to Redwood Landfill in Novato. And it's a big hole in the ground where the garbage is compacted and covered with dirt. It looks like a big mountain and it stays there forever. Um, we send about 500 tons of garbage a day to the landfill. Um, it's pretty crazy to see how much trash goes to the landfill. It's about 15 of those trucks you see in the picture each day drive from our facility. So that's just small central Marin and take that to the landfill. So you can imagine how much more trash is coming from San Francisco or other places as well. So, you know, every little bit that we can do to reduce the waste we create actually really has an impact. Um, just some tools that we have. If you live in Marin, you can download our app. Um, just search in the app store Marin Sanitary Service or go to our website. If you ever have a question about an item, whether it should be recycled or composted or go in the landfill, you can type in that item and it will tell you where it goes. And then we're also on social media. So follow us on Instagram or Facebook. We provide a lot of educational information and tips. And just in summary, what can we all do? So we like to go by the four R's. So reducing is the most important one. So preventing waste upstream. So supporting legislation to hold producers responsible for their waste. Um, trying to buy less things, use less stuff, generate less waste whenever we can, um, reusing whenever possible. So using reusables. I love that Lola was talking about using her reusable cup. That's awesome. You know, use your reusable water bottle. <laughs> um, and then, you know, recycle when you can. So learning what's actually recyclable and what's not and teaching people how to properly sort recycling and then using aluminum and glass instead of plastic. We really need to cut down on our plastic use and then composting. So I want everyone to go away from this presentation and share with someone um, the importance of composting to clear, curb climate change. Here's some flyers we have. If you're ever interested, you can go to our website to find them or contact your local resource hauler. And yeah, I'll open up for questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Simone. 
I am eager to know what is the name of that app you just shared? It's called um, Marin Sanitary Service. If so we just... go we go onto our app store. So I'm gonna put this in the chat for everyone. So um, in the app store, we're going to type I can in... send the link if that's more helpful. And you can also um, hit the stop share button. Oh yeah. Too. So the app store is called Man, um, Man Sanitary Services. That is a great useful tool because I know that every time I walk up to the compost bin, even though there are pictures, I still don't know which I'm supposed to put in there. So question for you, if the, uh, if the plastic ware, so the fork and the spoon looks to be made out of recycled material, can it go in the compost or does it have to have like a little recycle emblem on it? So that's where it gets tricky. Um, it depends where you live. In Marin County, we cannot accept any compostable plastics in the compost. Um, I know the rules in San Francisco are slightly different um, and that's based upon where the compost material is sent. So I would say check with where you live on that one. <laughs> And for the audience, if you want to ask questions, you can use the Q&A box and we can make sure that Simone answers your questions. So Simone, um, when it comes to, to understanding, oh, and let's have Mark come on too. Mark, you want to come on and we'll do a little town hall here? Yeah, sure. All right. So when it comes to methane, I want to dive in a little bit more about the connection between air quality and composting. So let's, let's dive into what what does it mean to put the organic material in the landfill and for it to have off-gassing? So um, Simone, you want to take that first? Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned, um, when food waste goes to the landfill, because landfills are covered, so the food waste gets buried in dirt, um, the food waste breaks down without oxygen, which releases methane in the process. Um, some landfills are able to capture some of the methane, um, but a lot of times this methane escapes the landfill. But when food waste is sent to a compost facility, they're able to turn the food waste and add oxygen and heat to it, which doesn't release the methane. And then it's able to be turned into compost soil. And Mark, from your perspective, how, how important is it for us to really um, understand the difference between CO2 and methane and how it's impacting our environment and our air quality? Well, in, in terms of climate, um, there's a lot more CO2 in the air, but methane is a lot more powerful per unit mass at causing warming, like over a 20 year time frame, which is the most relevant. It's about 86 times the CO2 warming potential per unit mass. Uh, but in terms of air pollution, methane, uh, well, CO2 is pretty inert. It doesn't chemically react with anything. It does affect temperature, which affects chemical reactions. But methane actually decomposes into other chemicals that does increase air pollution, such as ozone, but over kind of over a long period of time. So it's more of a large scale increase of air pollution. But in terms of bio, when you use a digester, for example, to process methane uh, from a landfill, um, or capture the, capture the methane. You know, we, the question is, what do you do with the methane? If you just burn it in a power plant, then you're just increasing pollution too. Um, however, you know, the, I think the one application that is okay because, like in our plans to transition energy, we don't include any bioenergy at all, except, you know, if it is from a landfill and it's going to be going to the air anyway, if you can capture it, I would then use it to produce hydrogen for a fuel cell, because then you have no chemical emissions except for water vapor, and you don't have the burning that you would um, with natural with uh, produce using methane in a power plant. So then you can use the hydrogen for other applications that uh, don't that don't involve combustion. So that's the real the one application of bioenergy I would support. So Flora asks a really important question here: Is the packaging industry doing anything to reduce use of plastic instead of expecting the consumers to deal with it? Um. There's some movements to change, but there aren't strong laws in the US right now, basically that exist to force producers to change. So that's why people are supporting legislation 
or lobbying for legislation to actually put that burden on companies that are producing this packaging and products made of plastic. Um, but because plastic is tied to the oil industry, um, they have a lot of power and it's hard to legislate them. Yeah. And Mark, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, if we can come up with alternatives to plastic, that's ideally what we want. Um, I don't work in that area so much. I don't know what the latest technologies are, but, but I mean, I've, you know, we see paper straws, for example, instead of plastic straws. I think that's probably a step forward. Well, and, uh, and sometimes things come back to bite us. So I worked really hard years ago on the bag, the ban, ban the bag. And, and then we come out with thicker bags and that you know, may be worse for the environment. And so there's always a repercussion to everything that we do. So you know, getting the plastic industry on board seems like a no brainer. The print industry, good news is the print industry has already gotten on board. They're mostly using recyclable um, or recycled uh, paper. They're using soy-based inks. And so this has been an industry-wide change for the printing industry. So packaging, however, and we look at plastics, that's, that's an entire different uh, ball game there. So it'd be interesting to find out more information about that. Um, so Diana asks uh, this question. So she says she used to compost her at home, all of her garden stuff and turn it into soil. Is this actually counterproductive? No, um, composting at home is great. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you have access to a backyard compost, that's great to do that. But, you know, most, a lot of people can't do that. So it's easier to just put their compost in, in their green cart, but yeah. Well, I've, I've also had the buckets of where all the flies come and then it gets a mess. And then the family says, why are you doing this? And <laughs> so, so it becomes a huge fight and then, you know, give up after a few months. Um, and when I'm hearing it about some of the apartment complexes around the area that have now uh, started using compost bins is that some of the residents may be, may be, you know, adverse to the smell. And so what do, what do people who are in co-housing or multifamily housing, how are they supposed to deal with this? If the, if somebody just rolls up a compost bin and says, here it is. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some challenges. I say, if you have, you know, a small bin in your kitchen, take it out frequently. Um, some people keep theirs in the freezer, which eliminates the smell, um, but just emptying it as frequently as possible. And then, you know, as far as for your outdoor cart, um, you know, pests do happen, but if that food waste is in the trash, they might be getting it in there anyway. So we do offer straps for our carts for people that have really bad raccoons, or I saw someone mention bears, <laughs> um, but just having it picked up frequently. We also provide a service if people ever want their big cart cleaned, we can do that. Um, so yeah, it's part of just like getting used to it and making sure that your food waste doesn't sit out for too long. Good to know. Last question, and this one is here is for you, Mark. Um, if you go to 100% renewable, is that only just giving a supplement to PG&E and you still get a variety of sources of energy in your own home? Um, well, the grid is interconnected to everything. So what you're really doing is you're, like when you go with Silicon Valley Clean Energy, for example, they and you sign up, they're actually purchasing wind, new wind and solar. So they might purchase their rights to a new wind farm or something. So that's actually going to real renewable energy. It's not fake accounting. However, what you get on the grid is really a mix of all the electrons in California, no matter where they come from. Uh, yeah, so you're contributing to reducing the fraction of electricity on the grid. Uh, and thanks to you, yeah, you're you're dedicating your money towards 100% renewables for sure. But the actual electrons you're getting are a mixture. Well, thank you for that information. Both of you have been so helpful today. I appreciate everyone who joined us on our webinar, and we will be sending out the recording in a few days. Um, we are coming up on Fourth of July next week, so you can expect an email from me later next week with a link to the recording. All of the other recordings we've done, all of our webinar series, are on sequoialiving.org forward slash webinars. So our past two 
Legacy Talks webinars are posted there. They're also on the Sequoia Living YouTube page. So I encourage everybody to go and watch in case you've missed those two. And I look forward to interacting on this topic again and sending out more resources. So thank you everyone for being interested and go out and be good stewards for the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.